The mistletoe hung in the castle hall, the holly branch shone on the old oak wall, the baron's retainers were blithe and gay, keeping the Christmas holiday. The baron beheld with a father's pride his beautiful child, Lord Lovell's bride, and she with her bright I seem to be the star of that goodly company. Oh, the mistletoe bow, oh, the mistletoe bow. I'm weary of dancing now, she cried. Here, tarry a moment, I'll hide, I'll hide. And love will be sure you're the first to trace the clue to my secret hiding place. Away she ran, and her friends began, each tower to search and each nook to scan. And young Lovell cried, oh, where do you hide? I'm lonesome without you, my own fair bride. Oh, the mistletoe bow, oh, the mistletoe bow. Oh, the mistletoe bow, oh, the mistletoe bow. They sought her that night, they sought her the next day. They sought her in vain when a week passed away. In the highest, the lowest, the loneliest spot, young Lovell sought wildly but found her not. The years passed by and their brief at last was told as a sorrowful tale long past. When Lovell appeared, all the children cried, See the old man weeps for his his fairy bride, oh the mistletoe bow, oh the mistletoe bow. At length an old chest that had long laid hid was found in the castle, they raised the lid. A skeleton form lay mouldering there in the bridal wreath of that lady fair. How sad the day when in sportive jest she hid from her lord in the old oak chest. It closed with a spring and a dreadful doom, and the bride laid clasped in a living tomb. Oh, the mistletoe bow, oh, the mistletoe bow, oh, the mistletoe bow. Oh, the mistletoe bow. The Brown Lady of Raynham Hall, as she is known, is believed to be a Lady Dorothy Walpole Townsend, who married Charles Townsend in the 1700s. Supposedly, Charles went quite insane and kept his wife prisoner in the house, reporting that she had died when in fact he was keeping her locked up. Dorothy never again left the confines of Raynham Hall, and perhaps rooms its hallways still. There have been numerous encounters through the years, including this one, recorded in 1891 by Miss Florence Marriott. My father took possession of the room in which the portrait of the apparition hung, and in which she had been often seen, and slept each night with a loaded revolver under his pillow. For two days, however, he saw nothing, and the third was to be the limit of his stay. On the third night, however, two young men, nephews of the baronet, knocked at his door as he was undressing to go to bed, and asked him to step over to their room, which was at the other end of the corridor, and give them his opinion on a new gun just arrived from London. My father was in his shirt and trousers, but as the hour was late, and everybody had retired to rest except themselves, he prepared to accompany them as he was. As they were leaving the room, he caught up his revolver. In case you meet the brown lady, he said, laughing. When the inspection of the gun was over, the young men in the same spirit declared they would accompany my father back again. In case you meet the brown lady, they repeated, laughing also. The three gentlemen therefore returned in company. The corridor was long and dark, for the lights had been extinguished, but as they reached the middle of it, they saw the glimmer of a lamp coming towards them from the other end. One of the ladies going to visit the nurseries, whispered the young townshens to my father. Now the bedroom doors in that corridor faced each other, 
and each room had a double door with a space between, as is the case in many old-fashioned houses. My father, as I have said, was in shirt and trousers only, and his native modesty made him feel uncomfortable, so he slipped within one of the outer doors, his friends following his example, in order to conceal himself until the lady should have passed by. I have heard him describe how he watched her approaching nearer and nearer, through the chink of the door, until, as she was close enough for him to distinguish the colours and style of her costume, he recognised the figure as the facsimile of the portrait of the brown lady. He had his finger on the trigger of his revolver, and was about to demand it to stop and give the reason for its presence there, when the figure halted of its own accord before the door behind which he stood, and holding the lighted lamp she carried to her features, grinned in a malicious and diabolical manner at him. This act so infuriated my father, who was anything but lamb-like in disposition, that he sprang into the corridor with a bound, and discharged the revolver right in her face. The figure instantly disappeared, the figure at which for several minutes three men had been looking together, and the bullet passed through the outer door of the room on the opposite side of the corridor, and lodged in the panel of the inner one. My father never attempted again to interfere with the brown lady of Raynham. The story of Sir Geoffrey de Mandeville is absolutely brimming with political betrayals. Geoffrey was a great landowner in Essex and elsewhere, and hereditary constable of the Tower of London. He came to prominence in 1140, when King Stephen, who could not dispense with his support against Matilda, a rival claimant for the throne, made him the first Earl of Essex. When Stephen was captured by Matilda's supporters in February of 1141, Geoffrey deserted to her and was granted virtually vice-regal powers in Essex. Before the rout of Matilda's forces at Winchester in September of 1141, Stephen's queen brought Geoffrey back to the royalist side by more concessions, possibly including the vice-regal powers in London, Middlesex and Hertfordshire which were formally granted him by Stephen in December of 1141. By 1143, Sir Geoffrey made his final mistake and was tried for treason by King Stephen and then exiled. Later that year, Sir Geoffrey was slain on the battlefield, but because of his exile, he was not allowed a proper Christian internment, which many believe left his spirit trapped within the earthly realm. Now, rumour claims that Sir Geoffrey also left a curse on the properties he owned, stating that, should they ever be taken away from him, ruin would befall his betrayer, and every six years, on Christmas Eve, he and a headless dog would haunt the land draped in a red cloak. Ever since his demise, people who have visited the properties he once owned, particularly the Pimsbrook Bridge in East Barnet, have reported hearing strange sounds and witnessing the hazy image of a headless dog breaking through the fog, accompanied by a knight in full armor and a red cloak. Ladies and gentlemen, I do extend my heartfelt gratitude for your distinguished company on this most extraordinary Yuletide journey. The chronicles of these three true British Christmas ghost stories steeped in tradition and mystery have graced our gathering today. If these spectral tales have evoked the wonder and curiosity they so deserve, I implore you to demonstrate your appreciation with the most gracious of gestures, a delicate tap upon the like button, and should you find it fitting, the honorable act of subscribing to this channel your support, dear viewers, is nothing short of the finest gift. As we retire to our festively adorned chambers, may these ghostly narratives linger in your thoughts like the echo of Christmas carols on a snowy eve. And should you possess your own chilling Yuletide encounters with the otherworldly, I beseech you to share them in the comments below, for the tapestry of the paranormal is forever enriched by your contributions. In readiness for the next chapter on our enigmatic odyssey, kindly engage the notification bell with the swiftness of Santa's sleigh on Christmas Eve. Until that time, may your fireside be warm, your heart be light, and may you enjoy a season of mirth and merriment unlike any other. Farewell, kindred spirits, and I eagerly await our next rendezvous amidst the mystique of the holiday season.